The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, a cold case detective investigates the most famous murder of all time. That's possible. It's just not reasonable. Then, an Iwo Jima hero who was awarded the Purple Heart and the Congressional Medal of Honor. This former Marine remembers his battles in and out of the war zone. You're not the same person you were before. Plus, Roma Downey opens the box full of butterflies. They just came to represent hope and the goodness of God. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Kim Jong-un's surprise visit to China could affect the upcoming U.S. summit with North Korea. Analysts believe both Kim and the Chinese president mapped out a game plan for the talks. China is North Korea's strongest ally, and Kim spent several days there this week. National security correspondent Eric Rosales has the story. The two-day secret meeting between the leaders from North Korea and China could lead to another seat at the table when President Trump sits down to talk with Kim Jong-un. China brings some extra clout after President Xi Jinping announced North Korea's commitment to denuclearization. Both are signals to the American president that the young reclusive dictator has the support of China, the most formidable power in the region. The commitment to stand down on nukes follows a busy year of a combined 17 full-flight missile tests, including North Korea's sixth and largest nuclear test to date. Since that show of force has been followed by a surprise olive branch, some question North Korea's motives. Regardless, experts call for the U.S. to pursue a specific goal when it eventually gets to the negotiating table. This first meeting should be keenly focused on the actual steps that North Korea will take to denuclearize and to end its ballistic missile program. Retired Army Colonel Scott Lingenfelter says the U.S. should only move forward with talks if North Korea proves it's serious toward meeting that demand. The former commander who served in South Korea says Kim Jong-un must be open to inspections and physically turning over rocket pieces. Otherwise, no deal. He can't be trusted and he has absolutely no record uh, nor did his father or his grandfather have any record of reliability when it comes to negotiating uh, with the West. I, I mean, in the six power talks, his father walked away. North Korea defense experts say that the U.S. should not offer anything like oil, food or money to curry favor with North Korea. Back in 2009, the North Koreans actually asked the South Koreans for $10 billion to have a summit. Now, the South Koreans said no, but this is where this could potentially go. If this denuclearization goal were to be reached, Kazianis warns the U.S. would still have a long way to go in Asia. We have to remember the long-term threat the United States faces. North Korea is part of that, but China is the bigger threat. And the latest reports just this morning is that the leaders of North and South Korea will meet April 27th. The key topic is denuclearization. And we also know that China's president sent a message to Trump saying that Kim Jong-un looks forward to meeting him. But uh, President Trump's public response, at least for now, maximum sanctions and pressure must be maintained on the North Korean regime at all costs. Gordon. Well, Eric, let me ask you a couple of follow-up questions here. Has the White House weighed in on about China getting involved in these talks? Oh, most definitely. You know, the White House is actually saying publicly that they are optimistic about this, but cautiously. And uh, you know what? I tell you what, you know, bringing China into the picture really narrows the scope for President Trump when you take a look at exactly where he can actually take these talks. Bringing China into the picture, uh, you know, that just creates even even more problems for the Trump administration. Kim Jong-un's decision to run to Big Brother is definitely a uh, is definitely a hat in for uh, uh, for Kim Jong-un. But now that the president uh, will be dealing not just with North Korea, but also with China, it uh, it you cannot. Uh, misplace the magnitude of this, you know, that there is also no deal with China without uh, without North Korea uh, getting into the picture as well. So it, it's interesting, uh, you know, the U.S. remains cautiously optimistic with this. And actually, the Japanese prime minister is uh, getting involved as well. He wants to have a meeting with President Trump on April 19th just to talk strategy before President Trump will actually go and speak with North Korea. Well, it looks like the region has some new hope. This is the first time 
a leader of North Korea has ever gone to South Korea. Uh, you know, could we get reunification on the table? Uh, could that be part of the discussion? Most definitely. I mean, I think I think reunification that comes later on down the line. You know, the, the main thing that we have to talk about, especially in this first meeting, has to do with exactly what to do uh, with denuclearization, how that's going to look. Spell that out for Kim Jong Un. You know, that the last thing that the U.S. should do is is provide any sort of promises. That's what happens with with, with a lot of these talks. Is you know, things are promised and, and sometimes are not delivered. And uh, we need to have proof that Kim Jong-un is serious about this, you know. And, and I think what's interesting is President Trump is actually uh, gearing up for this when bringing in, uh, uh, bringing in Bolton into the picture and uh, also uh, Pompeo into the picture to deal with North Korea, uh, the national secretary uh, of, uh, of um, uh, homeland security and also uh, just trying to be able to to deal with this catastrophic issue with North Korea being able to uh, to, to find out that they are serious about dealing with uh, taking denuclearization off the table. Is the administration speaking with one voice? Is there one opinion on on, on the U.S. side of this negotiation? Uh, Mathis, the defense secretary, has already come out saying he has a different worldview. Uh, than John Bolton, who is, is sort of brand new to the team. Uh, are, are we going to see conflict in the administration on strategy going into the talks? You know, Madison Bolton have said that they are willing to work together on this. You know, Bolton actually wants uh, more of a uh, overthrowing. He actually wrote an op-ed talking about how he wants to overthrow the Korean government, possibly by force, where you talk to Mattis and he still wants uh, diplomacy and uh, being able to work out a, a situation because he actually says that it will be catastrophic if, in fact, a preemptive strike has taken place. But, you know, let's face it, all Kim Jong-un is interested in is what is good for Kim Jong-un. He wants to be able to take away some of these sanctions. He wants to be able to work, work together uh, with the United States in order to be able to uh, uh, take some of these sanctions that are taking place against, against him from the United Nations. But this is a man who cannot be trusted. When you take a look at satellite imagery, uh, it's already showing that Kim Jong Un is firing up some of his nuclear uh, nuclear reactors after years of construction. So uh, that's what's taking place right now. Satellite imagery, according to my sources over at the Pentagon, shows that uh, he is still doing his nuclear reactive type of tests, uh, but doing so quietly. So the United States again remains cautiously optimistic. All right, we will too. And Eric, we look forward to future reports. Uh, I'll you. just weigh in on one comment on this, that uh, a war on the Korean peninsula would be absolutely catastrophic. Uh, the entire city of Seoul would be reduced to rubble. Uh, there are more artillery weapons aimed at that city than any other place on the planet. Uh, and literally the destruction would happen in 20 minutes. Uh, there's, uh, we don't have an alternative here. We need to have peace. Uh, and it's wonderful that we're finally talking. Well, in other news, there's another shakeup in the Trump administration. John Jessup has more on that story from Washington. John. Thanks, Gordon. President Trump has chosen White House physician Ronnie Floyd, Ronnie Jackson, rather, to be his new Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Trump is said to be impressed with Jackson's January press briefing when he answered questions on the president's health for almost an hour. Jackson is an active duty rear admiral who practiced combat medicine in Iraq. He served as White House physician for three administrations. Trump fired former VA Secretary David Shulkin Wednesday evening after an internal report criticized an official trip he took to Europe last year. Well, French citizens marched through the streets of Paris Wednesday demanding an end to anti-Semitism. The demonstration comes with growing concerns over a rise in anti-Jewish hate crimes throughout the country. Gary Lane has more. Thousands demonstrated in the streets of Paris, singing the French national anthem, showing the world that France stands united against anti-Semitism. Politicians, Christians, Jews and Muslims gathered throughout France, just after the funeral of 85-year-old Morel Knoll. A Holocaust survivor, Knoll was stabbed 11 times. Her charred body was found after the murderer set her apartment ablaze to conceal the crime. It started as a memorial in honor of uh, Mrs. Knoll, who was uh, killed. Once we've known that it was anti-Semitic motive, 
uh, then it became a march against anti-Semitism because she is the 11th person being killed for the only reason that she was Jewish. French officials ruled the murder an act of anti-Semitism, a hate crime. Noel's 29-year-old Muslim neighbor and a homeless man were charged. As thousands marched to honor Mrs. Noel, there was another anti-Semitic incident in Paris, nearby at the French Jewish Students' Union at the Sorbonne. Written on an office wall were the words, death to Israel and Palestine will win. So it makes me really angry and I'm looking for the government, for the police, for the justice, for the universities to condemn this act and to react very uh, uh, strong. French officials have pledged to do what they can to prevent more attacks. But fearing the worst, some of the nation's 500,000 Jews have already fled the country. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. And it's not just Paris, Gordon, or France, Gordon. It's all throughout uh, Europe, according to these groups that monitor anti-Semitism. Well, there's a growing rise, uh, and, and we all need to be concerned about it. But what it does underline is the need for Israel, the need for a nation, a need for the Jewish people to have the right of self-determination within their own national borders. Uh, there needs to be a place of refuge. Uh, and thank God there is one. And we're celebrating the 70th year uh, of the founding of Israel this year. Uh, and praise God for it. Terry? Well, up next, two atheists set out to debunk Christianity. And what they found next rocked their beliefs. They'll share the undeniable evidence they discovered when we come back. When two atheists decided to examine the evidence for the resurrection, their goal was to prove that the event never happened. Instead, they ran up against facts they couldn't dismiss, and now these diehard skeptics have become strong defenders of the Christian faith. As a successful cold case detective, Jay Warner Wallace became so well known at solving decades old murders, he ended up as the foremost expert on national TV true crime shows. Wallace was also an atheist and decided to turn his superior detective skills to disproving the resurrection of Jesus Christ, or maybe even proving it if the evidence took him there. And I'm gonna have to figure out how to evaluate that for its truthfulness, given the skill set that I had as a cold case detective. CBN News talked to him at a crowded conference where many hundreds gathered to hear Wallace tell his story and learn how their faith in Christ rests on solid evidence. For years, some doubters clung to one theory that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, but was just nearly dead and revived later. Wallace points out when you work with dead bodies all the time, like he has, and people in Christ's time did, you can definitely tell dead from nearly dead. Hot blood's gonna stop circulating. You're gonna cool down. That's called algor mortis, and that's, that you'll be cool to the touch. And we can actually judge time of death based on how cool. And I've seen this my entire career. There's a thing called rigor mortis. You won't be as, as flexible as you would be if you were just unconscious. And Warner finds in the book of John a key point of proof, a line about blood and water coming out of Jesus' body on the cross when a Roman soldier pierced him with a spear. Water will collect in your lungs. Now, if that happens and you pierce that cavity, you're going to see a separation of blood and water. It struck Wallace powerfully that John wrote of this. He's either so clever that he included some little known biological fact that nobody would discover for 1,800 years, or he just reported what he saw. And as a result, uh, we have a good piece of hidden science that confirms that Jesus actually died of cardiac arrest on that cross and was dead at the point of taking the body off the cross. The Renaissance said, we don't need God, why? See how great man, woman is. As an atheist, Josh McDowell set off to write evidence that demands a verdict to show the evidence about Christ, including his resurrection, was so weak, the verdict would be not true. The resurrection was one of several things I knew I had to refute as a non-believer. But instead of refuting, he became so convinced it happened, he spends dozens of pages knocking down false theories, such as Christ didn't really die, but woke up and escaped from the tomb. There were 100 and some pounds in casement of aromatic spices and gummy cement consistency around his body, wrapped tightly in three separate linen cloths, weighing about 117 pounds encased in that, and it becomes hardened. Second, how would he be able to move in such a state like that, move a one and a half to two ton stone away from the entrance? 
As for the idea that after the crucifixion, the disciples stole Christ's body, well, the Jewish leaders opposed to Jesus were so afraid of that very thing happening, they talked the Romans into posting a massive guard group, probably 16 soldiers outside Christ's tomb. So McDowell scoffs at the idea the disciples could have pulled off such a heist. The impossibility of that that they could have climbed through there, tiptoed around all the guards, and become uh, invisible to the guards in front of the tomb, roll one after two ton stone, that at day day they said that 20 men could move it. Wallace can't accept this was all just a conspiracy because detectives know those often fall apart when the people involved face real threats if they don't recant. And we don't have a single ancient record of any of the disciples ever recanting when that was often the goal of the people who were persecuting. Christians. Wallace points out courts don't expect the law to prove no possible doubt, only no reasonable doubt. So is it possible that they conspired for 60 years at 500 plus people under immense pressure with not enough family relationships to hold it together? Yeah, it's possible. It's just not reasonable. Remember too, all the early believers were fervent Jews who faced dire danger if they broke the Sabbath. Alex McFarland, who organized this conference, points out how that changed right after Jesus' resurrection. Pious Jews whose very relationship with God is contingent on keeping a Sabbath that they've observed for centuries, suddenly, overnight, begin to worship on Sunday. Why? Something must have happened. Sunday was Resurrection Day. Now, you have to understand what it meant to the Jew if they ever broke the Sabbath. It could mean death. In the empty tomb, we have it all, ironclad, guaranteed. I tell people the tomb was left empty so that your life could be made full. It gives me hope that as Christ is raised to the dead, I shall be too because of that. If Christ physically rose from the grave, then uh, that proves his identity, message, and, and credentials. What, what was his identity? God incarnate. What was his message? Salvation by faith in, in what he did on the cross. His credentials, virgin-born, sinless life rose from the dead, i.e., he is the Savior. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the Truth for a New Generation Conference, Greensboro, North Carolina. Well, this Easter, if you want more truths about the Bible and the resurrection, all you have to do is go to cbnnews.com. And while there, you can find out how to pick up a copy of J. Warner Wallace's book, Cold Case Christianity. Terry? Up next, he's one of four living Medal of Honor recipients from World War II and the only one who fought in the Battle of Iwo Jima. Now he wants people to know about the fight he endured in the years after the war. You're not the same person you were before. You don't think the same. My problem was I couldn't forgive myself. Hear how this American hero finally found victory on an Easter Sunday. On March 26, 1945, the battle for Iwo Jima finally ended. Herschel Woody Williams had been fighting on the island for all but two days of the bloody five-week campaign. And even though the guns were silent, Herschel never knew peace until a Sunday, 17 years later. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Corporal Woody Williams was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. The medal was earned for his heroic actions on Iwo Jima. A month later, Woody was wounded by shrapnel, but refused to leave the battlefield. For that, he was awarded the Purple Heart. Guam was simply get them before they get you, you got to do this to win. You got to take the island, and the only way you can take the island is to get rid of the people. Iwo Jima was a little different in that it was open. In the jungle, you felt a little more safe because you felt you could hide. You could get behind something. There's a tree, there's a hole, there's something you can get in. On Iwo, that wasn't the case. In February of 1945, the tiny island of Iwo Jima with its lone airstrip was the most coveted piece of real estate on the planet. Woody and his battalion overtook a network of seven pillboxes. With his 70-pound flamethrower, he led an epic attack that lasted four hours. That was my job. That's what I'd been trained for. So it wasn't anything unusual, except now I'm the guy that is in the forefront. 
All I'm doing is what they asked me to do. That same day, with the island now secure, Woody saw Old Glory waving over Mount Suribachi. The iconic photo made headlines around the world, stirring up a sense of jubilation because victory was now in sight. But victory, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder, especially for the man who pulls the trigger. You almost become inhuman. You don't think of it, or at least I didn't think of it, as a being, an enemy. That was a term we used. Yet, that word gave, gave me a little bit of trouble because they hadn't done anything to me. It's hard to think of somebody as an enemy that you don't even know. But that's what we've been taught. They are our enemy. They are trying to kill us, so your job is to get them first. Not only did Woody kill several of the enemy, but two of his fellow Marines gave their own lives to save him. I wasn't bothered particularly until I got home. Then you try to return back to where you were prior to going into the service. It's almost impossible. You're not the same person you were before. You don't think the same. My problem was I couldn't forgive myself. After the war, he married Ruby Dale and they had two daughters. Ruby was a Christian who went to church regularly. Woody was much different. A few times when we would go visit her folks, I would go to church with the family, just walk in. It had absolutely no meaning whatsoever to me. And in fact, it was boring. I had no concept of God or religion. And what can God do for me? I don't even understand him. How, 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 could, how could I think that he could help me when I don't even know him? On Easter Sunday, 1962, he decided to go to church with Ruby and his girls. The pastor was talking about Christ giving his life for us. It seemed like all the time he was talking, he's looking at me. He was uh, using the illustration of uh, Christ being nailed to the cross, and uh, he used his fist and his big old hand to emphasize the pounding of the nail, you know, like that. And he's hitting his hand, saying at the same time, uh, you helped nail Christ to the cross. And that Christ had sacrificed his life just for us. Well, that hit home with these two Marines. Here are two individuals who didn't have to give their life, but they did, protecting me. And it really got me. It really got me. And for the first time, I realized that there are sacrifices made for us. Then he continued to talk about he suffered all of this just so you could be forgiven. That was my problem. You don't get up in the middle of a sermon and walk up in front of a Methodist church. You know, I did. <laughs> And he stopped, because he didn't know why I was there, and said something to the effect, can I help you, or what do you want, or something. <clears throat> and my response was, would you pray for me? I had never asked anybody to pray for me before, but he came down off the, from behind the pulpit. We knelt at the rail, and he prayed, and asked that God forgive me, and he did. And. Uh, I left there a completely different person than I was when I walked in. Woody met with a pastor over the next few weeks and learned what it meant to be a new man in Jesus Christ. The sacrifice that God made by giving His Son so we can have a pathway to heaven. We couldn't get there any other way, and He tells us that very straightforward. You can only get to the Father if you come through me. And that's pretty strong. Today, most of the locals know Woody Williams. Maybe it's because he's a hero or just a good friend. Maybe it's because he's taught Sunday school at his church for 44 years. First, I was teaching young people. And uh, as time went on, the young people got old. And then I've been teaching old people. Ruby passed away in 2007. And Woody, at 94 years old, still remembers Easter fondly for it was the day he found forgiveness.
I would hope that Easter would mean more than just one day. And I hope that it would have an effect every day. And because you get a peace by being in God's hands, by following Jesus Christ, you get a peace that you can't find any place else. There is no place in this, on this earth. And he's the only one that can do that. He is the only one that can give you peace. It's his very name, the Prince of Peace. And he says clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And that way, that way took him to a cross where he gave himself Yes, the Romans crucified him, but he did it willingly. He said, I want to pay the price so that you don't have to. I want to pay the price so that you can be with me for all eternity, so that you can have a life and have it more abundantly, so that you can have righteousness, peace, and joy in me. If you want that, bow your head with me. Let's pray a very simple prayer and let Jesus come to you. He wants to prove to you that he is your savior. He wants to give you forgiveness. He wants to give you peace. He wants to give you joy. He wants to give you a new life. All you have to do is ask for it. And here's his promise that he will manifest himself to you. That means he will show up right where you are. Christianity is not a religion where you get cleaned up first or you do all the right things first and then God will pay attention to you. Christianity is a savior who comes to seek and to save those who are lost. So he's looking for you right now. And all you have to do is say, here I am. Could you come to me? If this is for you, bow your head with me. Let's pray and let Jesus do all the rest for you. Pray with me. Jesus, that's right, just say his name. Say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you and I open my heart and I ask that you come in. I ask that you forgive me, that you set me free, that you make me new again. And Jesus, if you do this for me, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer. Show up for me, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask that you surround them with your presence, with your joy, with your peace, with your forgiveness. Let them know that their prayer has been heard and has been answered today. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more step I want you to take. The Bible says that when you believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us and say, I prayed with that guy on TV. Numbers on the screen, 1-800-700-7000. When you call, there's something for you. It's a free packet. It's called A New Day. And there's a CD teaching. What do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? What do Christians believe? And just like Woody did, uh, the pastor took him through some uh, steps to let him know what had happened to him, to sort of explain it. We want to explain it for you. Uh, packets free, phone calls free. All you have to do is pick up the phone. 1-800-700-7000. Terry, over to you. Still ahead, a military couple who was forced to pinch pennies just to feed the family. Sometimes I worry at night, like, is there something I can sell in the house just to get an extra $10 for that week? 
Watch how this family receives a hand up at a time when they needed it most. And welcome back to the 700 Club. A new federal study shows an increase in the number of security officers assigned to America's schools. Last month's shooting at a Florida high school has put a new focus on the role of armed security officers. A new study released today by the National Center for Education says armed officers were present at least once a week in 43 percent of all public schools during the school year of 2015 and 16. That is compared to 31 percent just a decade before. Facebook is giving its privacy tools a makeover amid criticism over its data practices. Facebook says it's trying to give users a simpler way to access and use privacy settings. Users can also download a copy of their Facebook data. The company has also announced over the next six months, it will begin limiting data it makes available to advertisers, which will have a big impact on those targeted ads you see on your feeds. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website, it's cbnnews.com. Gordon and Terry are back with much more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Sean serves his country in the military and then spends his weekends trying to make some extra money. That's because his son has a rare condition. So when we found out that this military family was in need, helping the home front was there to get them back on their feet. E-5 Corpsman Sean has no problem balancing giving his best to the Navy and being dad. His wife Jessica couldn't be more appreciative. I'm so proud of him. He is a very strong, hard worker. Um, he would do anything for our family, anything for his job, anything for our country. Sean is quick to give Jessica just as much praise. Not only am I serving, but she's serving as well. She has to deal with the sacrifices of moving away from the family, um, dealing with the boys all by herself a lot of times when I'm out in the field. It's awesome. I just think she's an amazing person. Their lives dramatically changed when their youngest was diagnosed with a rare food allergy disease at just five months old. He was hospitalized 17 times while doctors attempted to determine the correct treatment. They were talking about, you know, having to switch him to this formula and he may never have foods again and he may never grow and he may need feeding tubes and all these thoughts and plans that you have in your head for this innocent little baby are just thrown out the window. Doctors put Cohen on a highly specialized diet. Their grocery bill doubled. You really have to plan and budget what you can eat. And then sometimes I worry at night, like, is there something I can sell in the house just to get Cohen's special meal, just so he can have something special this week? I'll look through old toys or maybe old clothes that I have, anything that could maybe be of value to someone else just to get an extra $10 for that week. I'll be like, you know what? Maybe I can go do like odd jobs on the weekends, give up my time with the family, go do an odd job, make, you know, a hundred bucks on a Saturday, even if I'm gone all day. While researching Cohen's rare condition, Jessica found a physician who specialized in the disease, but the doctor didn't accept military insurance. The couple simply couldn't afford the cost. We know there's somebody there that can possibly give us more answers and it's out of our reach. It's, it is the most like heart-wrenching feeling ever. Then the couple learned both of their vehicles needed brake repairs and new tires. As Christians, Sean and Jessica relied on their faith in God to keep them going. It's brought me closer to God and it's made me thankful that our family is taken care of on a daily basis. He's always telling me when I pray, you know, he's like, you know what, just, I got this. Their church, New Song in Oceanside, California, asked CBN's Helping the Home Front to get involved. Pastor Hal Seed invited Sean and Jessica over to let them know we were fixing the brakes and buying four new tires for both vehicles. We're gonna do that this afternoon. We're gonna go down there and get your car fixed and CBN's gonna pay for it. Oh my goodness. Wow, that's amazing. That so how do you feel about that? Excited. Then Pastor Hal told them the church would use CBN funds to pay for Cohen's specialized diet. Oh my goodness. Wow, that's amazing. Because just last night we had to go buy 
three almond milks for him and we had to think, okay, we have $10 that we have to make this work. Like, where can we find a coupon for it? That's amazing. And that specialist you've been praying about, we're gonna pay for that too. Oh my, oh my gosh. Oh. So, all we need to do is set the schedule. Thank you. Very good. Pastor Hal took Sean and Jessica to Cornerstone to repair the brakes and buy new tires. Then he took them shopping to get stocked up on food for Cohen. And the family set up the schedule for the specialist who can give them answers about Cohen's condition. God is so good. Even when you can't see he's working, he's working. If you could just trust in him, he's always working and he's always on your side. You know, I was touched by what Jessica said when she said, we knew that there's someone out there who might be able to help us with the issue with our child, but it was out of our reach. You know, there are things that CBN does around the world for people in third world countries, but folks, these are our military families right here in the good old U.S. of A. And you may not realize it, but because of their circumstances, there are often things that are out of their reach. Helping the home front is changing that. They're making a huge difference. When you join the 700 Club, you make this outreach possible and all the other work we do around the world, whether it's digging wells, helping people with micro enterprise opportunities, community transformation, orphan work, all the things that CBN is doing and always bringing the message of the love of God in the midst of it. That's why today we're asking you to join the 700 Club. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month, which may not seem like much, when we all join hands together, it becomes a lot. So will you join with the rest of us so that we can touch folks here at home as well as around the world? When you call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000, all you have to do is say, I want to join the 700 Club. The friend on the other end of the line will walk you through that very simple process. And our way of saying thank you for caring about other people is to send you Answered Prayer. It's Pat's latest DVD. It talks about the 50 plus years of ministry, how he's seen God's hand move on his behalf, how to pray efficiently and effectively, and you'll hear great testimonies from other people as well. Prayer makes a difference. We want you to have this. So you help us reach out to others and become a part of what's happening, will you? It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. Gordon? Well, still ahead, the Touched by an Angel star shares how she's bringing a little bit of heaven down to earth. Let's speak words of love to each other. Let's respect each other. Let's reach out and find a little bit of unity. Roma Downey opens up about life, loss, and her box of butterflies when we come back. For nine seasons, Roma Downey starred on the beloved TV show, Touched by an Angel. In recent years, she's helped produce faith-friendly hits such as the Bible miniseries and Son of God. Well, now she's working to bring good news through the website Lightworkers. And recently she sat down with us to talk about how her faith got her through some of the darkest times in her life. Okay, so this is my book, Box of Butterflies. And I have something very special to share with you today. You ready? Roma Downey is smiling <laughs> and joyous sitting down with CBN at her Lightworker studio outside of LA. She's excited to talk about the release of her new book, Box of Butterflies, which delves into some of her darkest moments. My mother unfortunately died unexpectedly when I was just 10 years of age. It was like the lights had been turned out and it created a lot of uh, uh, heartache and confusion. And I thank God we were a family of faith. And so, you know, we, we were able to really lean into our faith to support us. And I remember going up to the city cemetery with my dad and a butterfly flew up behind the stone. And my dad said, would you look at that little butterfly? Sure, that could be your mother's spirit right there. And in the midst of my, you know, heartbreak as a child, it brought me such comfort, the idea that my beloved mother, you know, somehow was still with me. It also started just to represent that God was with me. And anytime I felt 
down or, um, you know, that I was struggling and I would move into prayer, um, unexpectedly these butterflies would show up, maybe on a truck or on a billboard or a tattoo or something, and they just came to represent um, uh, hope and the goodness of God. Roma, who lost her father while she was in college, talks about how God ordered her steps from Ireland to the Big Apple and how she took a bold step at an audition, landing the role of her career as an undercover angel named Monica on the acclaimed TV series, Touched by an Angel. There was a scene in each episode, we called it on the set, the angel revelation scene. And they would say, God help me, please help me. And that was the moment as the angel that we were able to step in and say, I'm an angel and I have been sent by the Almighty to tell you that you are a special child of His, you know? And who hasn't wished for that moment in their own lives, right? That we, and maybe it won't come so profoundly for us, but, but God is there in all the small ways and in all the kindness that other people show you. You know, I have seen God work through a smile of somebody in a supermarket in a morning that I'm feeling stressed out. I've seen Him work in big ways in my life. He brought Della Reese to me. I was a girl that needed a mother, and Della Reese stepped into my life to be the mother that I'd always longed for. Roma Loster touched by an Angel co-star and friend, Della Reese, in 2017. She finds comfort in knowing Della gave Box of Butterflies her blessing before it went to print. The pages tell how their relationship bloomed beyond the set. I loved her, of course, but I really admired her. She was a pioneer in so many ways, and she was so courageous, having come up in the 50s and 60s as a black woman in this country, and the things that she had to endure just had so much courage and grace. And while we were working together, her only daughter died. And so I became the daughter that she was looking for, and she became the mother that I was looking for. And only God could do that. When I asked her if she would uh, honor me by writing the foreword, and she said, you know, where do I sign up? Her book is filled with scriptures and uplifting quotes from famous poets and influencers, from Nelson Mandela and Helen Keller to Rick Warren. Their words of kindness and love, Roma says, we all need to hear from time to time. I see when I go on my social media that there's a lot of people hiding behind the anonymity, Instagram handles or Twitter handles, and just saying the most hateful things to each other. And I think like that's one real practical way that we could show up in our faith by, you know, don't be mean. Let's speak words of love to each other. Let's respect each other. Let's reach out in, uh, and find a little bit of unity. The actress, producer, and author recently launched the website lightworkers.com, which features short video clips that highlight the goodness all around us. It's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And I love that. It's like, instead of sitting around moaning about all the negativity or the bad stuff that's happening, get up, get off the couch, and do something about it. Roma acknowledges God's love as the light that guided her through darkness and shaped her into the woman she is today. Oh my gosh, God's love has just taken me, taken the girl who thought she was unworthy. You know, there was a little child in me somehow thought if I had been more or better or had done something different that my mom wouldn't have died. And it was the love of Jesus and you know, they're just leaning into knowing that that unconditional love supply isn't going anywhere. And the promise through our faith and through Jesus that, that my mom might be dead, but I'm going to see her again. And this is the promise that we all have. And as for our hopes for a box of butterflies, I know that there's somebody out there that's hurting, that's feeling the pain of a loss of somebody they loved. And I wrote the book just for them. I think other people might enjoy it, but I know there's one person out there that's really gonna, you know, is gonna bring home to God. And that was my plan for the book, that it would bring people home to God, that it would, you know, that it would, that it would remind them 
and, um, and so I, I pray that's what it does. I would imagine there are many people, many, many people who will be blessed by this book. If you'd like to hear more from Roma Downey, pick up a copy of her book. It's really beautiful. It's called Box of Butterflies, filled with wonderful artistic additions to the book. It's available wherever books are sold. And boy, what a good word. Let kindness umpire your words, your attitude, and <laughs> the things you, you do. <laughs> Time for some email. Are you All ready? Right. I think okay. I am. Okay. <laughs> if I'm this, not, I'll just ask you yeah. the same question. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. This is Karen Gordon who says, I did not come from a very touchy-feely loving family. My younger brother was the favorite. I knew my mom loved me because she cooked and cleaned and took care of our physical needs, but she never gave us many hugs or kisses. My father wasn't very loving either. I know in my heart that God, my father, loves me, but I never really learned how to feel or receive God's love because of the relationship I had with my earthly parents. My father is deceased now. How do I learn to feel God's love? My past is hindering my relationship with God. Karen, I think you have um, something that's common. I, I think a lot of people, uh, particularly anyone who grew up in an abusive environment, has trouble even saying the Lord's Prayer to say, Our Father, uh, who art in heaven, to, to even utter those words because it brings back the memories uh, of what happened. And I encourage people who, who have gone through that kind of experience to ask God to reparent them, to say, I, I didn't have the childhood that I really wanted. Could you come and be my parent now? And you'll find that he will be for you what he has for so many others. He will be the God of all comfort. And he will come to you and be that special one and fill that special place in your heart. All you have to do is ask for it. Just freely admit, I, I'm, I'm having trouble with this relationship with you and I, and I need you to help me. And if you're just honest with him on that, then he'll come and he'll do what he's promised to do. Oh, great answer. This is Mitchell. Here's <laughs> a question. <laughs> yes, you do. He gets an A today. <laughs> Just going to reserve that for today. <laughs> oh, wait, I got another question here. I could flunk the next one. Yeah. So. This is Mitchell who says, I have special needs and I live with my parents. I desperately want to get a job so I have money of my own, but my parents don't think I should. How can I change their minds? Uh, Mitchell, here's a question for you and, and go ask your parents. Do they expect to live forever? Yes, really. Um, and, and just be, uh, I know that's an in your face question, uh, but ask them that question. And it, you know, at some point in time, they're not going to be there to take care of you. So if you're not now learning how to get employed, how to stand up on your own uh, and live on your own, uh, then uh, you're, 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 you're always going to be dependent on them. Their concern is based that they're concerned over you. Uh, they know how hard it is in the workplace and they're trying to protect you. Um, but if, if you're ready for it, uh, that's always the sign. If you're ready for it, then I would encourage you to go for it. Yeah. Independence is such a good thing. Yes, it is. Okay, this is Cliff Gordon who says, I have a couple questions regarding Mark 4.12. It says they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Who were the ones Jesus, Jesus didn't want to be converted and have their sins been forgiven? Bigger question, why would he not want everyone to be converted? Um, you're, you're missing the point. He's quoting Isaiah. Uh, and he, Jesus is referring to that prophecy and saying of the crowd who is not believing, who is not seeing, uh, saying what's, what's happening here is this is being filled up in them. The pro prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. And that prophecy, I believe you find in Isaiah chapter 6, that there will be a veil over all people and, and will be separated from God. We won't be able to see him, uh, which is, is an astounding thing. Our sins have separated us from God. And in that, we don't see his nature. We don't know his ways. Uh, the key to this verse is to say, I want my ears opened. I want my eyes opened. That's the prayer of the Apostle Paul, that I may know the greatness of your power towards us who believe. 
That's all the time we have. Hopefully I did okay on that question too. We'll find a out plus, from plus. Terry. <laughs> Here's a word from Corinthians. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new.